Hello and welcome to a new video on cryptography for everybody. In today's video, we will have a look at malware and malware analysis. I gave this here as a test lecture a few weeks ago, and I thought it could be also interesting for the viewers of this channel. And in this video, you learn about malware, how malware functions, and how we can analyze malware. I structure the lecture into five different parts. In the first part, you will get to know the definitions and classifications of malware. Then, in a bigger part, we will have a brief look at viruses. After that, we will have a look at Trojans. And finally, we will have a look at malware analysis. And in the end, we will have a conclusion and a summary. Let's start with two definitions of malware. I found these definitions in different sources. The first one is from a German dictionary, and uh, the second one is from the German Federal Office for Information Security, BSI. Also, as a hint, the complete lecture I gave in German, and I translated it for you to English. Let's begin with the first definition. Malware, composed of malicious and ware of software, refers to a harmful program called malicious software. These are computer programs that have been developed to carry out functions that are unwanted or harmful to the user. The term does not refer to de defect software, although this can also cause damage. As I said, this is translated from German from the Gabler Wirtschaftslexikon. The second definition from the BSI. Malware is an artificial word derived from malicious software. It refers to software that has been developed with the aim of executing unwanted and usually harmful functions on an IT system. This usually happens without the user's knowledge. We have different important keywords that are highlighted here. First of all, malware are computer programs. It's malicious software, it's unwanted, it's harmful, it attacks IT systems and often without the user's knowledge. Now let's have a look at the classification of different malware. And I also found this classification on the BSI website. You can see the source here below. The first class of malware are viruses. And these are self-spreading malware with host. And for example, a host can be a document, a program, and so on. Then we have Trojan horses. This malware hides in seemingly useful software. So you download a software and you think it's useful for you, but in the background it's a Trojan horse that installs different other malware. Then we have bots. That is malware that establishes a control channel to the attacker. And you probably know the term bot network. If you have many of these bots, then you have a bot network. Then we have worms, that is malware that can spread independently via a network. We have rootkits, that is malware whose aim is to hide as deeply as possible in the attack system, and the name suggests it, it comes from the term root, the super user of a system who has privileges on the highest level, so the rootkits try to be installed or to get root access. Then we have scareware, that is malware that the user installs himself out of fear or by deception. For instance, you get a message from this malware that a virus has been detected on your system, and if you install the software, it will remove the virus, but in fact, it installs then itself, and it, it's a malware itself. Then we have ransomware, you probably also know this. That is malware that restricts the availability of, for instance, data and demands a ransom for accessing it. Usually ransomware encrypts your files and then wants bitcoins, for example, to give you the key that you are able to decrypt the files again. Then we have spyware, that is spy software that records the user's behavior, for example. And finally, we have backdoors. Backdoors usually come, for instance, with Trojan horses into your system. And backdoors are malware through which a system can be controlled by third parties without the user noticing. Now let's see a few definitions of viruses. The first definition, again, is from the BSI. And a virus is a classic form of malware that spreads itself and can have varying degrees of malicious potential, from no malicious function to deletion of data on a hard disk. Viruses occur in combination with a host, for example, an infected document or a program. Important keywords are that viruses are malware, 
a virus spreads itself and a virus has varying degrees of malicious potential. Then I have a second definition from the book from Belou and Saladuka, Viruses, Hardware and Software Trojans. A computer virus is a specially written, usually small program that is capable of writing possibly modified copies of itself in executable files, hard disk system areas, drivers, documents and so on, with the copies retaining the ability to self-replicate. Important keywords from this definition are that viruses are small programs, they copy themselves and they perform self-replication. Now let's have a look at goals of viruses. And we have two main goals. The first goal is replication, that means to copy and spread itself. And the second goal is to execute potentially harmful functions, which we also call the payload. And here you can see the exponential spread of viruses. And I compare these to human viruses. That's why we call these also computer viruses. You have one document with a virus. It copies itself into additional documents. These documents or executables are then started and they spread again and again and again. And so you have exponential spread. And the same is with human malware, with human viruses. You have a first one who has a virus it spreads the virus to two different persons. These persons spread the virus again, and we also have exponential growth or exponential spread of the virus. Here we have now selected virus subclasses. On top, we have the virus itself, and you can divide the different types of viruses in subclasses. We have the executable virus, which puts itself into an executable. And we have two subclasses here. We have the overwriting virus that completely overwrites the executable. And we have the parasitic virus that puts itself into the executable. And also we have the macrovirus, what that is we will see later. And all these four types of viruses we will have a look on later. Then additionally, we have, for example, driver virus that hides itself in uh, drivers of your computer. We have source code viruses. These are really interesting. They put themselves into source code. Then we have boot sector viruses that copy themselves into the boot sector of your hard drive. And we have many more. This classification is based on this nice website here. Let's start with the overwriting virus. The virus overwrites the executable program completely. And so the distribution method here is, for example, that the user copies an overwritten file to a storage medium and another user executes this on another PC. For instance, via inflected files on network drivers, especially in companies who use shared drives, this is really a problem. The problem from the perspective of the virus itself is that the original program is lost. So a user will see that the program does not run and he will think, oh, this could be a virus. So optimizations from the point of view of the virus developer would be to first check whether the file has already been overwritten and also do not overwrite all files on a system to avoid immediate detection. And how does the overwriting virus work? You have here a header and the code block of, for instance, executable file. The, vi the virus just overwrites it completely. So all here is lost. Then we have the parasitic virus and here the appended one. And this virus is smarter. It appends itself after the end of the executable. So we have the original executable here. Then we have the new executable. We have the modified here by the virus who appended itself to the end of the file and clearly it has to change the header to change the entrance point of the code here. So when the user starts a program, the execution immediately starts here at the virus. The virus is executed and then it jumps back to the code block. So from the perspective of the user, the program works as he expects it to work. So the virus modifies the start address of the actual program code in the header file or in the file header. And the distribution method here is the same. User copies an infected file to storage medium and other users executes this on another PC and then also via infected files on network drives. The problems here are that or a problem here is that the digital signature of the original file is now defective. So if you have a valid digital signature here, clearly here it's defect because you destroyed or the virus destroyed it by appending itself to the executable. Then we have the same class of virus, but prepended. So instead of writing itself at the end of the exe file, it writes itself in front of the code block. 
So the problem here is that the original program must be completely rewritten by the virus because all internal jumps here are now to different addresses. So this is very difficult to change all the jumps here and that makes this virus very um, unpractical, I would say, from the point of the virus developer. Clearly, digital signatures of this virus or of this exe file are also destroyed because now we have here the virus and everything changed. And then the most interesting part of the parasitic virus, it's the virus that is distributed inside the program, which we also call a cavity, a cavity virus. That means you have in the code block, we have anti blocks that are just uh, null, so you have no values there, and the virus writes itself into the empty parts of the code block. Then the virus modifies the start address again. You can see here from the header, it jumps in the first part of the virus, from there in the second part, and then it jumps back to the original code block. We have the same problem here. The digital signature of the original file is defective. The exe file digital signature is not valid anymore. But this type of virus is more difficult to detect since the file size here remain the same. So the entire file must be analyzed to see a difference. Then we have the macro virus. What is a macro? A macro is an executable sequence of instructions and can execute any operating system command. So it's very powerful, but also very dangerous. You can see here an example, Microsoft Visual Basic for Applications or VBA. Excel and Word, among others, allow you to write entire programs in VBA. And a macro virus is now a virus that is written in VBA or another script language, for example. Macro viruses infect, for example, Word and Excel documents by copying themselves into them. You can see it here. You have a Word document with a virus and it copies it to other Word or Excel files on your system. And macro viruses use also the user's address book, for example, to send themselves as email attachments to the user's contacts to spread furthermore. Now let's have a look at the payload and the destructive function of viruses. First of all, the payload is a part of the virus that causes damage or at least does something. When or why does the payload become active? We have two types to activate or that the virus activates the, py uh, the payload. First of all, it's time-controlled activation. That can be, for instance, after a certain time, a timeout. After, let's say, an hour or two, the virus becomes active or at a specific date or time. Let's say at Christmas, the virus or the payload of the virus becomes active. And the second type to activate or that viruses activate their pay payload is event controlled activation. That can be a mouse click, a key press or a program start or any other event that you can think of that can happen on a computer. Now let's see what does the payload do on purpose and what does the payload virus do unintentionally? Because we have to differentiate between, between these two things. First of all, the very first viruses <laughs> did something funny. So a pop-up with a funny text or playing a music or so. But this is only an exception. Most viruses destroys or destroy data, they destroy hardware, they destroy firmware, and they consume computer resources that you clearly want to use for different things. An example for uh, computer resource consumption is, for instance, Bitcoin mining. But on top of that, on the things that viruses or the payload do on purpose, they do unintentionally things. For instance, a program could crash, the computer runs slowly because the virus consumes all the resources, we have a high memory usage, or in the end, the computer could also crash. Now let's have a look at Trojans, and I have also two definitions. Trojan is malware that is hidden in seemingly useful or interesting documents or programs. The malicious operations are carried out secretly. Trojan horses often try to collect specific information like files, keystrokes, screenshots, and transmit it to the outside world without being detected, or open backdoors to enable follow-up attacks. This was translated from German from the German BSI. Important keywords here are that 
Trojans are malware, they are seemingly useful or interesting, they are carried out secretly, they gather information, and they install backdoors. Another definition I found was is that a Trojan horse is a program that contains a destructive function that is activated when a certain trigger condition is met. Usually such programs are disguised as useful utilities. Viruses can carry Trojan horses or Trojanize other programs and give them destructive functions. This is from Belu and Saladuka, Viruses, Hardware and Software Trojans. Important keywords are here, a Trojan horse is a program with a destructive function disguised as a useful utility. Now, there are also hardware Trojans and this is just a look beyond the horizon. This is not part of this lecture here. In addition to classic software Trojans, there's also the large area of hardware Trojans. A hardware Trojan could be a firmware Trojan that is part of a firmware of a hardware. It could be a malicious hardware itself. For instance, you find a USB stick on a parking area of your company. You put it into your computer because you, are, you want to see what is on that USB stick. But in fact, it's not a USB stick, it's malicious hardware. It now installs other malware on your computer. And finally, we have the most dangerous hardware Trojans. These are IC Trojans. These are Trojan horses that are built into the integrated circuits that you have in your computer. What are the goals of Trojans? We have two goals. The targeted and possibly accidental installation on the victim's computer. And the second goal is to set up another malware program. So you download a software you're interested in to use, but in fact it contains a Trojan horse and the Trojan horse then installs itself and potentially other programs on your computer. And later here you can see it can also install um, backdoors, rootkits or spyware on your computer. Here are some selected subclasses of Trojans. We have Trojans here on the top. Then we have the subclass linker that we will have a detailed look on later. Then we have the dropper. So the linker is linked to a program. Then we have the dropper that drops additional programs, additional malware on your computer. We have the downloader that downloads additional malware. And we have so host software with native program code. Here the Trojan is directly integrated and the malicious function in the native program. This is based on this website here. So what is a linker? A linker appends itself as malware to the executable and fully functional host file. And we already know that from the viruses. Examples are Word documents, Excel documents, or executable files. We have the exe file here, and the Trojan horse is just part of the executable now. And how does this Malware spread, how do Trojans spread? They spread via email, USB stick, CD, DVD, and so on. Now let's have a look at malware analysis. Before we start with that, here's a disclaimer. Working with malware can lead to damage to your IT system and network and the associated devices and to data loss. So I cannot take any responsibility for damage that may have been caused by you incorrectly handling malware. So if you want to try things out that you see in this video, you do it at your own risk. Let's start with a definition. Malware analysis refers to the process of investigating malicious software, malware, with the aim of understanding its behavior, functionality, and impact. The main goal of this analysis is to identify and understand the threat and develop appropriate countermeasures. And we have different types of malware analysis. We have static analysis, we have code analysis, we will have a look at these. And then we have dynamic analysis and behavioral analysis. What are the goals of malware analysis? Its first goal is identification of the class of malware. Do we have a virus, a Trojan horse, a bot, a worm, or whatever? Then the identification of the infection mechanisms. Is it, does it spread via exe files, email, network, and so on? And if possible, we want to identify the communication with the attacker. Then we want to collect information that can be used to create signatures. This, these can be file names, registry keys, etc. And these signatures are then used in antivirus systems, for example, to detect the malware later on. So we want, for instance, create a digital fingerprint, a hash value of the malware. And of course, we want to develop countermeasures, for example, for removal of malware or to repair of infected systems. 
Now, what kind of analysis environment do we use? We analyze malware in a secure sandbox environment. So the malware is kept, you can say, in a cage. We use a virtual machine with Oracle VirtualBox. We use Windows 10 Professional in this virtual box. We have no network connections, so the malware cannot <laughs> get out of its cage. We have no shared folders of guest and host system for the same reason. And we work with snapshots. That means we freeze the virtual machine at one point that we can reload that snapshot again and again and use different methods and tests to work with the malware. And we work with Flare VM. Flare VM is a collection of installation scripts for easy setup of a reverse engineering environment in a virtual machine. You can see here Flare VM on the right side, the logo, and it's available for free on GitHub. So if you want to test it on your, on your own, you can download it from GitHub here. Be aware that the installation takes some time. It takes a few hours on a standard PC to be installed, but after that, you have a really good malware analysis environment. Now let's have a look at the scenario that I invented for this lecture. We are now employees of the antivirus software manufacturer Smart Antivirus GmbH. Our company develops commercial antivirus software, which we sell mainly to small and medium-sized companies. And we are now security researchers and malware reverse engineers specializing in malware for the Windows operating system family. Here you can see the logo of this company. And the mission that we obtained is, we have received a suspicious executable, an exe file from a presumably infected computer. An analysis of the malware and signature creation for our antivirus software should take place. And we want to answer the following questions. What type of malware is it? What is the goal of the malware? How does the malware spread? And which communication channels does the malware use? And here's a note and a hint. For this video and for the lecture, I used a malware sample that comes from virussign.com. So if you're interested in analyzing malware on your own, you can register with them. You have to give them reasons why you do this. So it's not that you can just download malware, but if you register and they accept you, then you're allowed to download from their site virus samples for malware analysis. Now let's begin with static analysis. For static analysis, we use the PE Studio. It's a tool for finding suspicious artifacts in executable files. Questions that can be answered using the PE Studio are, what type of executable do we have, 32-bit or 64-bit, which compiler was used, which libraries were used, and which imports, so functions from the libraries, were used. And we get a first overview and an analysis of the existing strings, ASCII, UTF-8, etc., uh, of that file. And in addition, we read out the file hash. What are strings? Strings are just texts that are embedded in a program and that a human can read. And we can read out these strings using the PE Studio. Now I have a first video that, where I recorded how to work with PE Studio and we will have a look at this now. We are here now in the virtual machine. We have the virus.exe on the desktop. I start the PE Studio now. And then you can just open the virus exe, virus exe dot, uh, the virus.exe file. And here it now analyzes the virus. You can see that it was compiled with Visual Studio 2008. It's a 32-bit um, program. The subsystem is GUI. Here you can see the imported libraries. And we can see um, different functions imports from the library. And here are many network functions. So this is already suspicious. And here you can see already strings inside of that file. Here on the right side, you can see these different paths and so on. And here we can see the footprint, the uh, SHA-256 hash value. So what did we see with PE Studio? I have here a few slides that show you the most important part. First of all, we can see here the compiler. It uh, was compiled or developed with Visual Studio 2008. Be aware that, of course, this can be a false flag. Of course, virus and malware developers can fake this. But this is a good indication of which kind of malware it could be and with which um, language it has been developed, probably with C++ or with C. Then we have the file type here, executable, it's 32-bit, and it's a GUI program. 
so it's a Windows program. So here are the answers I already gave you. Then we can see here which libraries were integrated. And for us, very interesting is the WinINet DLL, because this is used for network communication. So probably the virus that we are analyzing does something with the network. And also which imports from the libraries are used. We can see here a list of imported functions and used functions. And also the HTTP open request W, internet connection W and HTTP send request W are very interesting because these are functions for network communications. And you can see here flags. These are indicators that these are potential, potential functions used by malware or often used by malware. So the PE Studio marks these for you. And these are very suspicious already for us. Now let's read out the strings again using the strings command line two. We are again on Flare VM on our virtual machine. Now we started a command line and I go to the desktop where I have the virus.exe and now I use strings dash n5 virus.exe. This reads out all strings of len5 and now I pipe these also into a text file so that I can later use this text file for further analysis. Here you can see the text file. And here you can see all the strings, all the texts that are embedded in the exe file of the potential malware or the virus. Now let's have a detailed look at the texts that you can find in the exe file. And this is a first overview of the existing strings, ASCII encoded or UTF-8 encoded. These are text encodings and standard strings are also in the exe file here. So these first ones here, these here that we can see here, these are embedded in all XE or all Windows XE files. You have this program cannot be run in DOS mode. You have this also, this is a DOS stop message. And then you have different segment indicators here like the text segment, our data, data, our source, relocation, and so on. These are standard strings that you can find in any XE file. But very interesting strings for us are, for example, these here. We have here an images slash something dot zip and here again, with images, icons, and then zip, it makes no sense to have a path with images, but then a zip file. This could be a packed or zipped additional malware that can be later downloaded. And now it gets very interesting. We have different URLs, probably with malware. So we have charmco AZ or dallasbooster.com. And additionally, we have exe file names. So probably the malware copies itself to somewhere on your computer and then it creates these file names here. This percentage %s backslash percent %s is also interesting. This is C formatting with a string with a backslash. Then we have some really crazy padding um, text here, padding, padding, xx padding and so on. This is probably a placeholder. And then this is also really interesting. We have additional strings here with C, users, admin, app load, app data, local temp and so on. These are folders where the malware probably copies itself. And here again, um, a name of an exe file. So this is all very suspicious. In addition, the strings output also contains all important functions. So this is also only an excerpt from all the strings you can find using the strings command. Here's also finally the footprint of the malware. This is also from PE Studio. It's a SHA-256 cryptographic hash value. So this is a fingerprint. And this was read out using um, PE Studio. Here's the complete fingerprint. And usually what we would do, we would first check this at, for instance, virustotal.com. It has a huge database with all these fingerprints, but we will do this later in the video, not now. Now let's have a look at code analysis. For code analysis, I use Ghidra. Ghidra is a suit in Java for reverse engineering. It's developed by the National Security Agency NSA Research Directorate to support of their cybersecurity mission. If you want to download Ghidra, it's a very, very powerful tool for malware or uh, general, generally for reverse engineering and for, and for malware analysis. You can download it from ghidra-sre.org. 
And questions to be answered in the code analysis is what does the malware do, how does the malware spread, how does the malware communicate, and which files or system resources are affected. And I again have a video showing you how Ghidra works. I'm here now again in the virtual machine, and the first thing I do is I start Ghidra. Takes a few seconds. And we have no active project, so we have to create a new project. It's a non-shared project. You can give it a name. Let's call it Virus Analysis, or in German Virus Analyse. And then we put the virus exe into our project. And now Ghidra performs a first analysis and it parses the virus exe.file and gives you a lot of interesting information here. For instance, we can also see what kind of program it is and so on. And when we double click it now, it will again analyze the file and you have to say yes. And then you can select different analyzers. And here now you can see in the middle, it reverse engineered the assembly code. And we could now go through the assembly code and have a look. But the more interesting part is that it can create based on the assembly code on the right side code for us. So this is C code that it reverse engineered based on the assembler code. And we can now go through the code and have a look at different functions. So we have an entry point, so main function, and here an additional function. Now let's have a look at some examples from the source code. And I copied a big block, lines 5 to 10 here now. And what does the malware do? In the step 5 here, it first creates memory, a heap, and assigns the uh, pointer to the heap to the variable 3. Then it allocates memory for a file name and for a buffer. Then it gets the module file name here in step 8. That means it gets the file name of the executable, so of itself. And it also gets the temporary path, so the path of temporary files of the user, and then it concatenates to the temporary path the uh, kdeohv.exe. So in the end, we have create a new heap, allocate memory, allocate memory, then write the file name of the executable file virusexe to lp file name, write the path of the user's temporary files into lp buffer, and append the file name to the path in LP buffer. So what does this all mean? Here, file paths are concatenated. Probably it want to copy itself. So the source is virus.exe and the seal, sorry for the German, the, the um, destination here is the temp folder of the user concatenated with kdeohw.exe here. And here's another example of the source code that you can have a look at. We have a function here with a funny name. So Ghidra uses placeholder names because it does not know the name of the function, but you can change these names during the analysis. And then we have a parameter one, a parameter two, and a parameter three. Then we have a check here. If param three is not zero, then this here will be executed. Otherwise it returns. So the parameter three has to be set. And then we have a loop here and it loops until the variable one or while the var variable one is smaller than parameter three and the variable one is incremented here. And then we have an assignment here. We have from um, this pointer here. So this is a point. This is a memory location to another memory location. What does it do? It copies a byte from this location to this location and then increments. So basically, this is a mem copy function that copies data from a source memory area to a target memory area. So the parameter one is a source pointer, the parameter two is a destination pointer in memory, and the parameter three is a size, the number in bytes that it should copy. And the local variable one here is a counter that is needed because we want to we want to copy or the, the method wants to copy all the bytes. So we have to count for each byte up until we copied all the bytes here. 
So, what does the malware do? The malware does the following things, among others, that I found out using this analysis. It first creates a copy of the exe file in the user's temp directory. So in the temp folder, we have kdeohw.exe. Then it starts the copy, so it executes the program here. It opens an HTTP connection to the web server dollarsbooster.com. It downloads the zip file from that server that is located in images icons 2805usmp.zip. It unpacks the zip file to another file called poertn.exe and then it starts the exe file poertn.exe. So what does this mean? So it distributes other malware. It downloads additional malware from a web server and uh, copies it on the machine. And then we have communication with the at attacker. It does this via a web server download and presumably within the downloaded malware. And downloading and analyzing of these pertin Dot .exe or poertn.exe or the zip would be a possible next step here in the analysis if the, style is, if the file is still available on the server. This is homework that you could do, but caution since you are working with malware that can damage your computer. Now let's have a brief look at dynamic and behavioral analysis. Only a brief look. Dynamic analysis using a debugger would be performed now. For instance, x32dbg. This is a very good debugger. You can see the logo here. But this is not today due to time constraints of the lecture. And we have uh, to analyze then individual assembler instructions, that is machine code opcodes, that we are then clicked through using the debugger. The function could be further analyzed of the malware using the debugger live execution and FakeNet NG. FakeNet NG is a very nice tool that simulates a computer network in your virtual machine. Since many of the malwares that you analyze only work properly if they have good or at least an internet connection. And execution debugging of the virus XE would look like the um, First, the virus copies itself to temporary files uh, di directory, so temp kdeohv.x is the third thing that happens. Then the virus starts a copy, the kdeohv.w.exe, uh, and then finally the virus terminates itself. Um, for further analysis, the exe file had to be started manually with administration privileges. It attempts to delete a file that with, with this large name here located on the C folder in an endless loop. And once a file has been deleted, it attempts to download a zip file of dollarsbooster.com. We will see this later in a video. And since the server in the VM is not available and the fake web server would have, uh, would have been to, uh, provided through the malware, we will stop here. And we will at least take a look now at the execution of the virus in the next video that I show you. And yeah, it's, at one point you have just to start the malware and see what happens, clearly in a secure environment. Let's have a look at that video now. I'm here now again in the virtual machine and I have these two files here. I have this on uh, this very, uh, the file with a very strange name. First I go to the temp folder and I delete everything that I have here that I can delete. Other things that I cannot delete, I just do not delete here right now. Now I will just start the virus. So double click it. And you can see on the right side, we have now kdeohw.exe in the temp folder. Now I start FakeNet. FakeNet simulates a network so that the virus thinks, thinks that it has a network connection. And now I have to provide the, the file that the virus is constantly looking for. So I copy the file now from the desktop. It's just an empty file with the correct file name to the C folder. You can see it is now on C. Fakenet is running. And now I start the copy. And when I start the copy, as an administrator, you can see it deleted the file that's located on C. 
And it also tried to get a file from its web server, from dollarsbooster.com. So it first copies itself to the temp folder, then it starts itself, we, had, we, we simulated that now, it deletes this strange file on, C, on the C drive, and then it tries to get files from dollarsbooster.com. As a result, we would write a short report now summarizing our findings. We found out that it is a virus Trojan horse without a useful part. And that means that if you click on the file, you do not even see anything as a user. That is what I mean without a useful part in the Trojan. The malware copies itself to the computer, restarts itself, and downloads additional malicious software, so it's a downloader. And now is the point where we can enter the signature into our system in our antivirus database. What is still open for us here in the video now is to check the SHA-256 hash with www.virustotal.com. And if you like, you could now stop the video and enter the virus at that web page. What you could also do, you could stop the video or pause the video and you could just scan this using your mobile phone and then it will take you also to virustotal.com and you have the hash value and you can see what kind of malware we have. Here we have the results, sorry for the German here, the ergebnisse of the results and this is only a part of virustotal.com here. Virustotal says that 68 of 72 um, programs here detected the malware and we see here Trojan Win32 Upetra B686 and what is Upetra? Upetra is a downloader family of malware that has been active since 2013 and it has been further developed updated since then. So we found out that our malware is a Upetra malware. Let's come to the conclusion. What did you learn today in the lecture or in this video? First of all, we had a look what is malware and its definition, that was chapter 1. We had a look at different classes of viruses trojans, chapter 2 and 3. We learned how do viruses trojans spread, chapter 2 and 3. What damage do viruses trojans cause, chapter 2 and 3. What is malware analysis, chapter 4. What type depth are there in malware analysis, chapter 4. And we had a look at a detailed procedure of malware analysis using an example malware, which was a downloader, upetri also in chapter 4. If there are any questions about uh, or on this lecture, please feel free to write comments below this video. And if you are further interested in the topic, I recommend literature, sources and software that are used here. First of all, if you're German, you could have a look at the Bundesamt für, Sicher für Sicherheit Informationstechnik BSI, that's very interesting. Then we have the definitions of the Gabler Wirtschaftslexikon of malware, also for the Germans. But then for the international viewers, you could download Flair VM, you could download PE Studio, you could download Ghidra, and also the book Hardware and Software Trojans, Attacks and Countermeasures from Belu, Anatoly and Vitaly Saladuka, Viruses from Springern is also very interesting. All images in this video that I used are either free or self-created. Yeah, and this is the end of the video. I hope it was interesting. It was not cryptography as I usually do on this channel, but I thought that an introduction to malware and malware analysis could also be interesting for you. Yeah, and as I said, this is everything. If you like what I do and you want to support me, please uh, like and subscribe here. It also really helps me to grow the channel and also to make, uh, to make Crypto 2 more popular, the tool that we usually use here on the channel. Yeah, and as I said, it's everything. So thank you very much for watching and see you in the next video.